John Schachter, S H A C T E R. What? My age, 84. 84 and a half. 84 and a half. Going on 85. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you end up in Oak Ridge, in the Secret City? Well, I, uh, I'm going to make it fast, but it, uh, I was born in uh, Austria, uh, spoke no English when I got here in 1938. Uh, I knew I wasn't going to get any dates with American girls in German, so I had all the incentive of a 17-year-old fellow to learn English fast. So I crashed English, uh, finished high school in Philadelphia, went to the University of Pennsylvania and got a chemical engineering degree, was hired in 1943 by Union Carbide on the Manhattan Project, and that was just exactly a few, few, few days after I got my citizenship papers as a damn foreigner. So <laughs> I uh, got into the project that way. And uh, I worked my way up in Union Carbide uh, to get in charge of process design. We can talk a little bit more about that. I think we ought to yeah, talk to about the differences the between the Kellex design and the Union Carbide design without getting into any classified uh, information. And uh, that made the nuclear energy industry, the, the 100 nuclear reactors in this country, possible from an economic point of view. So it's an important point to put now, across. Why don't you go ahead and tell us that story? Tell us how that happened. Well, uh, the Kellex uh, plant was successful, the uh, gas diffusion plant. And it, in fact, it put Y12 out of business and uh, put the S50, the uh, thermal diffusion plant, out of business. So it was the surviving process. And it worked like a charm without pilot plant. And Manson Benedict and the guys in uh, Kellex deserve a lot of credit. But Manson, Manson Benedict and Arthur Squires, who was became one of my supervisors in the early days, wrote a paper when Kellex bowed out of the project that they'd done all that could be done and there was really no need, no reason to do any research or development in gas diffusion anymore. Well, George Fellback, who was a big shot in Union Carbide, came down and said, if you guys had to do it all over again, how would you do it? And everybody thought that was a kind of a stupid question because, you know, how, wh wh what was there left to be done? Well, it turned out that uh, major improvements were made, uh, not only in barrier, but also in uh, uh, stage design, cascade design. And uh, some of those inventions were assigned to me. Uh, I got a dollar for each invention from Clark Center. <laughs> and it... Uh, that was in view of the fact that a lot of them were classified. I also got uh, on stage design, there was an unclassified patent uh, issued, and it's issued to me. And as a result of all the innovation after Kellex got through, we lowered the cost of uh, enrichment, of uranium enrichment, to the point where it was, became cheap enough for the nuclear industry. And since in the nuclear industry, most of the money goes for capital expense, not op operating expense, you can see that if you can shrink the size of the reactor because you have enriched uranium instead of normal uranium, and that shrinks the, co the cost of the reactor enormously. And that really facilitated the 100 reactors we have today and we're going back to nuclear industry, nuclear energy, I'm sure, and 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 that'll facilitate uh, new reactors. So it's a story that needs to be told because hardly anybody knows that uh, the Union Carbide inventions in uh, in K25 in the, the the plant and all the from K29, K31, K33, Paducah, Portsmouth, all those plants made the uh, breakthrough uh, possible. 
and that was Union Carbide, no longer Calix. So it was like almost like a different process rather than just improvements. And then later on, I moved to Union Carbide, New York, became manager of planning for the corporation. This was outside the nuclear division, the corporate uh, staff. Mm -hmm. and then came back to start a uh, multi-contractor group called ACOP in Oak Ridge, became a consultant after that and retired. So that's a quick, <laughs> that's a quick, <laughs> quick summary of my, my career. But I, I, I got quite deeply into corporate planning and uh, government planning and uh, uh, performance reviews. Uh, how do you judge the performance of a business and how do you, perf how do you judge performance of a business manager you know, what are the things that you look at? Today, they, you'll find that stuff in textbooks mm -hmm. for business uh, schools, and it's uh, well accepted. But right. we worked on it at a time when hardly anybody knew what we were talking about. So I got into a lot of innovation, not only on the technical side, but on the management side, and then became a professor, and adjunct professor, and taught uh, chemical engineering design and, uh, and economics. And uh, today I uh, still uh, am very active in education. I got back into public school education and I teach uh, uh, kids from uh, pre-K all the way up through high school. I like to teach math because uh, they all hate math. And I te teach math and money. They hate math, but they love money. <laughs> so I, I take, uh, I, I'm just take, I'm mean, I take full advantage of that. And uh, I teach with a, you know, with a light touch and a good sense of humor, and the kids like me. And they do learn a lot of math. And I think in teachers' colleges, they ought to, they ought to tell the graduates, I mean, the, the future teachers, that a good sense of humor is one of the best ways to teach kids. Keep them entertained. I mean, what the heck, if you're going to make him work and study, you might as well keep him entertained at the same time. So that's sort of my approach. So I'm deep, deeply involved in education, both on the practical side and uh, on the conceptual side. And I also uh, uh, have uh, right now, a uh, for the fifth year, a group of retirees. We talk about uh, current issue, uh, critical issues and choices. And I have people there from way left to way right, and I'm there to prevent fist fights, and I've been very successful so far. <laughs> you, came, you came to Tennessee in 1943? I came to Columbia University, Columbia the University. Manhattan Project, okay. in 1943, worked on Barrier for, short, for a few months, and then came to uh, K-25 permanently, in 44. I was down in Oak Ridge in 43 for an interview uh, for, uh, for Y-12, uh -huh. but uh, I per came down here uh, permanently, unquote, until <laughs> I moved up to New York uh, in uh, 1944. And, uh, and you worked directly, you worked at K-20, you worked on K-20. Worked in K-25 and mostly in uh, production and then uh, design and uh, uh, was, was placed in charge of uh, process design and uh, that's when I uh, got involved in some of these uh, innovations mm -hmm. and inventions that I was telling you about yeah. earlier. Uh, I knew the top guys in Union Carbide and Calix uh, directly. Manson Benedict is dead now and so is Clark Center and Bill Humes and all those guys that were on top, you know, I, you I, I know a lot of stories about them. <laughs> you might be interested in a couple. Sure, why don't you tell us a couple? Well, Clark Senna was uh, general manager of uh, what they called the Carbide and Carbon Chemicals Division of Union Carbide and Carbon Corporation in those days. That was quite a mouthful. <laughs> and after the war, they... Uh, uh, there was a Texas millionaire who was uh, contributing heavily to the politics, the political 
guys. So he, he was, so Clark Center was asked to make him welcome and show him, at least from a car, you know, the outside of the gas diffusion plant. He couldn't show him the inside. But so he took him around in this car and showed him the gigantic gas diffusion plant and bragged a little bit about it. And Clark Center said, said to this guy, you know, we this is the biggest darn plant that's ever been built on the, under one roof. He says, the people go run around in bicycles. I was one of the bicycles uh, in the plant. And the Texan said, shoot, he says, we got outhouses in Texas that are bigger than that. And Clark Center looked him up and down and he said, you guys need it. <laughs> <laughs> Clark had a good sense of humor. <laughs> Very dry, never laughed. <laughs> but, <laughs> I thought that was a great comeback. <laughs> That's a good comeback. Another interesting story, I mean laughable story, is that uh, after three or four years in uh, at the plant, no, maybe less than that, two years, I went back to Philadelphia and got myself a driver's license. And they were, I, I subscribed to a course that had uh, six hours, but I took it all at once. And uh, I knew nothing about driving and learned enough. Fortunately, it was snowing in Philadelphia, so I couldn't go fast. So they thought I was a very safe driver because they didn't know I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't drive any faster if the, <laughs> if, the, if the weather had been perfect. So I came down to back to to the plant and we had a truck that uh, everybody went to lunch with on the, at the cafeteria from the, from the place where we were working. And of course the keys were hanging on the, on the nail in the wall and I, I, as, as soon as I got my driver's license, I rushed to the keys and I drove. And it was raining and uh, I was on the, in the cat, cat uh, of the truck and the uh, guys were piling in the back and uh, and next to me and it was very noisy and uh, all of a sudden I heard fists on the roof of the truck and I opened the window and there was a fire engine that came at me from the rear and and half of the guys were jumping off rolling into the ditch <laughs> and the fire engine passed me with two wheels up on the sidewalk <laughs> blazing with sirens, and I hadn't heard them, and no, neither did anybody else in the cab of the truck, but it took me quite a while before the guys let me have those keys to the truck. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun. I, I like to folk dance. We, we in, the, in the city of Oak Ridge, uh, I was, uh, uh, there was a guy from Ithaca, New York, Cornell University professor who taught international folk dances. And my wife was a physical, ed, uh, physical education teacher at uh, the junior high school in Oak Ridge. And uh, so she joined the group to learn how to teach her girls something that was a little more sophisticated than put your little foot, because they were doing Russian dances and Polish dances and Austrian dances and everything else. And of course, uh, when I saw her dance, well, I decided that was going to be my uh, <laughs> wife. She didn't know it. And first time I told her she was, I was going to marry her, she laughed. But uh, <laughs> I was very persistent. <laughs> how, long did it take before she, how long did it take before she married you? Uh, several months. Uh, she, she was, she's from here, and mm -hmm. she grew up, and she was born in Morton County and spent the early years there and then moved to Knoxville, Fountain City. So she was a local girl, and uh, she was sure that I was uh, a damn Yankee, but she didn't realize that I was a damn foreigner, too. <laughs> so it took me a while to convince her that she really wanted me to, wanted me to marry her. <laughs> then we had two girls. I, I've always discriminated. I, I like girls. <laughs> and where did, where did you live? when you uh, moved to Oak Ridge. Did you live in dormitory? Initially in dormitories, yeah. Saginaw Hall in uh, West uh, Oak Ridge. And we used to go in buses mm -hmm. to the plant. And uh, then later on, I uh, 
uh, one of the Calix guys, Leo Waters, uh, he was a big shot, so he got a efficiency apartment. That was a one room uh, place with uh, the beds uh, folding up against the wall, the kitchen in the same room and everything else. And I thought that was a big improvement over the dormitory place and he, he needed a companion for it to get that uh, efficiency apartment. So I was lucky enough to graduate to that. Then later on after we got married, where I was eligible for uh, a little better facilities and then I moved to New York so I didn't get full advantage of the uh, better residences in Oak Ridge. Well, a lot of people still live in those original semester houses, what they call them. And uh, I imagine some of the people that you met are still living in original Oak Ridge housing. There was a lot of, you know, it was a, people came to Oak Ridge from all over the world. You know, I met, uh, for example, Wigner who was a Hungarian, got a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't meet a finer guy, very modest, brilliant guy. Boy, was he a fast thinker. And it was so unassuming. And he became uh, uh, director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory before Weinberg did. And. Uh, became later interested in civil defense and other things. But um, you couldn't help but uh, appreciate a guy like that. Uh, Manson Benedict, uh, uh, Hans Bethe, uh, you know, all those guys. Of course, I spoke German, so I could communicate with them in, in two languages, at least. Speak a little. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, spoke a little bit of French, but you know, just street French. Most of my, uh, the, the two languages I really spoke was uh, German and English in that order. I had six years of Latin, but I'm still looking for a guy to converse in Latin with. <laughs> Didn't do me much good. <laughs> when, uh, when you were working on the Manhattan Project, when you started um, with the laboratory and then came down here, did uh, you know what you were? Oh yeah, I knew. In, I knew the second. I I suspected it from the start, because there were some ma magazines in Life magazine or other things that had speculated about uh, international race for the for an atomic uh, reaction. They didn't know whether it was going to be a bomb or you know, but they knew it could produce more energy than it took. So as an energy producer, whether it would lead to a successful bomb, they didn't know. And one of the uh, ways to get there was uranium. Later on, they found out plutonium and reactors was another way. But in the early days, it was uranium. And uh, a fellow by the name of Hertz in uh, Germany had invented a process, you know, on, the la on a desk uh, scale test tube scale, to separate uh, uranium isotopes by gaseous diffusion because uh, the lighter isotopes moves a little bit faster. Than, it's like having a, a Jeep and a truck. And the, the Jeep moves faster, and uh, if you got a hole in, the, in, the, in a membrane, the Jeep can find that hole faster than the truck can. I'm overdoing it, of course. The differences in the isotopes are so small. You know, the, the two... One is uh, in uranium hexafluoride, it's uh, one in uh, 300, I mean, uh, 352 versus, uh, 353 versus 358. So the differences are very small on a percentage basis. And that's why you need so many uh, stages. And... Uh, but the, that was the idea, and he invented, invented that process decades earlier. And then uh, Lisa Meitner and uh, Hahn and Strassmann in Germany worked on uh, the atomic uh, reaction. And then we thought that we were competing with it, that we were racing the Germans, and whoever got the bomb first would win the war. 
so we worked days and nights. I mean, I uh, eight hour forget the eight hour day. I mean, that, that nobody worked eight hours. We worked day and night, literally, to try to beat the Germans, and found out later that they weren't all that far advanced, even though the initial breakthroughs came from Germany. When it came to the practical applications, they, they weren't even close to us. But we didn't find that out until the war was over. And of course, uh, there were a lot of lives saved in Japan. Now, whether we should have tried the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or the, whether we should have uh, demonstrated it offshore in the, in the ocean, where they could have watched it, <laughs> which might have been as convincing. I, you know, that's the controversy. It's still going on. I've since met a lot of people in the Navy and Army that would have gone to Japan had, had the war lasted, and there's no question in their mind that uh, they were pleased to have the war end that way. And I wouldn't be surprised if it saved a lot of uh, lives, because an invasion of Japan would have been extremely costly on both sides. Absolutely. And would have dwarfed the uh, deaths and, uh, and casualties in uh, Hiroshima and, uh, and Nagasaki. So there's a lot of people alive today that talk about these things without really knowing what they were talking about. What else would you like to know? Uh, okay. <laughs> so you weren't surprised, uh, or were you surprised, when, uh, when we dropped the atomic bomb? Oh, no. no. I didn't know when they were going to do it, uh, being in Oak Ridge. Okay. <laughs> and, of course, the Los Alamos people were closer to the final bomb design and stuff than we were. And if, uh, so in, in those days, I didn't keep up on a day-to-day -day basis with what was going on, but the, it was obvious that we were going to use the bomb in one way or another to convince the Japanese and the Germans to give up. And uh, then that was done. Yeah. So do you have any other good stories about, uh, about these uh, Union Carbide head honchos? Or the Kellex guys? Well, a lot of these uh, fellows had, had terrific personalities. Yeah. You couldn't meet a guy like Bill Humes. He, he was a gigantic guy. Real heavy bass voice, a uh, brilliant guy. He later became a Union Carbide vice president in uh, New York, and he was the one that asked for me to come to New York and work for him originally. This was in uh, 1956. And, uh, well, he, Bill Humes was the kind of manager who. Uh, was technically very well equipped. And uh, if you worked for him, you might be four or five levels down and find Bill Humes walking into your office and asking you, you know, what, how you were doing and what was bothering you and where do you think the management is doing right or wrong. Now, he would never make decisions bypassing all the levels in between. You know, he would not make decisions, but he would get a lot of information. And then he would use the line organization to do something about it. Well, there are not too many managers alive even today who have learned how to do that effectively. I've tried. You know, and I did get a, a, an award. The, uh, the secretaries in Tennessee, the, the professional secretaries in uh, Oak Ridge, gave me an award of uh, the boss of the year, which I was quite proud of. And I did get a, uh, uh, two engineering organizations, the Professional Engineers and the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, recognized me as the outstanding engineer of the year. So I'm still kind of proud of, of the technical <laughs> recognitions and uh, and uh, I, I've been very lucky. I've had a very varied career going from the technical, technical side all the way to management and education and issues, world issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I think we got a lot of problems. And uh, we are trying to run a democracy with ignorance. That's a little bit like male motherhood. You know, it's inconsistent. So uh, some of the problems we're having, if you let me solve education and maybe populations, uh, I can solve everything else, so could anybody else. But when you have big problems in education and you're trying to run, uh, you've heard the story of this guy that had a friend named Joe, and he asked Joe, Joe, do you think our world problems are mostly due to ignorance or apathy? And Joe said, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> I love that story because that's, that's really what's ailing us today. So, on the, on the, you know, you have to keep a light uh, touch on things or you go nuts if you worry about uh, today's problems. And, of course, we have uh, terrorists and uh, people that uh, don't mind dying. You know, those little boys in the madrasas, they, they're practically hypnotized in their... Uh, they want to go to paradise. And... Uh, so they strap uh, things on them, but with the uh, with uh, weapons of mass destruction, you know, not only nuclear, but chemical and biological coming along, uh, we're working ourselves into a corner. Obviously, you can have great discussions about timing, but the combination of suicide bombers and uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, spell the end of civilization if you think far enough, and really the only thing that you have a right to discuss is whether how much time you have to reverse some of the directions that are taking place right now. So I've, uh, over the years, I've gone through quite a bit of disciplines. Um, it, it is a multidiscipline problem, and being an engineer has helped me. And because I don't get scared on the technical side of things. You know, a lot of people know either the political side or the technical side, but not both, mm -hmm. or the educational side. And I've tried to consider it an obligation. You know, I'm paying back now. And uh, I retired uh, in 83, then consulted for a couple of years, and then after that I could afford to a volunteer, and I've been volunteering, uh, teaching, and uh, all that stuff since. And it's my way of paying. I, I feel very grateful for having been raised in the United States, had a career in the United States, and I'm trying to pay some of it back. Now, Secret City, of course, Oak Ridge was very, was very secret, but can you draw a parallel to today's security issues and the way that you guys felt when you were working in Oak Ridge because it was so tight. It was a completely different political situation, but there's some a little bit of the same atmosphere. That's right. The details are different because what was secret then is not necessarily what's secret now, here. But there's still people in other countries. You're, you probably have heard of this guy Khan who worked for Pakistan and mm -hmm. uh, was a, a brilliant guy, but he th he's, a, uh, he's, of course, a Mohammedan and, uh, in Pakistan, and he was responsible for proliferating a lot of technical knowledge on how to make nuclear bombs. And he gave those uh, secrets to Iran and uh, uh, North Korea and other places that we're worrying about today. So there is some overlap, and some of the uh, uranium enrichment and uh, plutonium producing items are still secret or top secret today, and they should be. And you have to be careful that you don't uh, slip uh, uh, into classified areas. And uh, that was true then, too. The details were different. Some of the details were different. But there's good reason for classification and for secrecy. And I think people that argue that there should not be any classifi classification or secrecy and that we're not really uh, fighting uh, uh,
terrorism and rogue nations, in my opinion, just don't know what they're talking about. That you know, it's like uh, like a kid, you're playing hide and seek, and the kid closes its eyes and think you can't see him, because he can't see you. Uh, you know, that it's a it's a game that should not really be played in politics today. We're in, in serious uh, si in a serious situation now. We were in a serious situation of a different type mm -hmm. then, and the not only the secrecy and the intelligence. It's critical uh, are involved, but so are uh, so is the knowledge that uh, the situation is very serious, and uh, there's no guarantees that uh, democracy or civilization will survive. Did you ever um, did you have trouble getting security clearance, or did anyone ever question you because you had a off no. background? No, no, Mike. My, my, I think Adolf Hitler saw to that. Uh, we, I was in Austria, and of course Adolf Hitler was an Austrian. Went to Germany, and when Germany took over Austria, I knew one of us had to get out. And Hitler wasn't getting out, so I decided I better get out. And it was pretty clear, you know, what my background was and stuff. And I never had any problems getting top uh, clearances in security clearances. And of course Schwarzenegger is also a fellow Austrian. He's governor of uh, California, and I keep telling people that I'm now taking uh, bodybuilding and groping classes, and I'm going to run for governor of Tennessee. <laughs> I want everybody to vote for me. <laughs>